Let us bow our heads in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. At the first service this morning, uh, Judy came into the um, vestry and said uh, to Nina, where's the tray? And Nina says, I don't know. I looked for it, but I couldn't find it. That was the silver tray that they bring the offertory up in. And so Judy said, now what must I do? And uh, she, I said, you know, Make a plan, you know. And, but it does remind me, because I like my things to be in place. I mean, things are not where I think they should be, or things don't happen as I think they should happen, then it gets a little bit upsetting. Did you notice something about the gospel reading? Did I read the right gospel? <laughs> Did I read the whole gospel? <laughs> Did I add to the gospel? Yes. I didn't stop where the lectionary said we had to stop. I went a little further. Because the punchline, they stopped before the punchline when Pilate says, what is truth? You know? You know, it's like people say, you know, how long is a piece of string? You know? And people think the truth is like that. You can stretch it each way, you know? If someone says it, you know, then they say, it is the truth. And today, if you shout loud enough that so-and-so is corrupt, then that makes them corrupt, whether they're corrupt or not. So, I mean, those of you that like philosophy and things like that, you can go and read Nietzsche and what he had to say about truth, and you can have a whole debate about that. But the important thing is that there are some things that you cannot change. And it's interesting when you think about the gospel to understand this debate that happened between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. You see, Pontius Pilate was a politician. He was a governor. He wanted to keep the Jews happy, and he had to keep his masters in Rome happy. And the way you keep masters in home happy is to make sure that there are no bad reports, you know. There's no, there's no unrest. You must, whatever you do, you know, there must be peace. So sometimes, like when a bishop comes, you don't want your parishioners to run with the stories to the bishop about what's happening in the church because that's, man, it's every now we're all together, we're all happy, you know. So that's the kind of thing that happens very often. And, but in the Jewish state of Israel, the Romans had a very clever way of ruling. Yes, they were the occupying force, but what better way to control people than let their own people control them? So if you look at the tax collectors, for example, the tax collectors were hated. But you know why they were hated? Because the Romans had a special arrangement with the Jews. They appointed the tax collectors. They got like almost like a license, you know, to tax. And so the tax collectors taxed their own people, collected the taxes on behalf of Rome, paid the money to Rome, but they kept a commission. And corrupt tax collectors would charge a bit more. <laughs> And especially if people couldn't, you know, deal with the arithmetic and all of that, they tax them more heavily, but they line their own pockets. And when you read the story with Zacchaeus, he said, if there's anybody that I robbed, I'll pay back four times. And they hated the tax collectors because they were, as it were, if you use the African word, impimpis. They were in the service of the people that were being hated. And so they were traitors in a way. But the Romans did something else. They gave the Jews freedom of worship 
provided there's no unrest. And so when Jesus came along, he was unsettling. He spoke about the tax collectors. He spoke about the priests that are whited sepulchers. And there was people were following him. And whenever there's a crowd, you know, it's not Black Friday. It's, uh, there's something there. I don't know what's wrong with our country that we now want to create things that people go into crowds to go and stomp on one another because they want to get something cheap. It's really uh, exploiting the worst in our society, greed. Get something for cheap or something for nothing. And so they don't like unrest. And uh, Jesus was creating, it was a following, and so he was going to, uh, in a way, damage this nice, cozy relationship that is happening. And this is the same thing. Take our own country now. It's getting nearer for election time. And people want votes. Okay? I was speaking to a friend who I can trust. And he tells me that he was doing, they were doing some programs to help um, uh, rehabilitate prisoners and, uh, and also to do some farm training for people that will, are going to get land and so that they can farm on it. And both those two programs are now suddenly, there's hardly any money for it because it's not going to bring in enough votes. <laughs> so you start to see the undercurrents of how people corrupt things. Okay. But Jesus is clear. He's clear in his response in the gospel today. You are right in saying, I am a king. In, for, in fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And through the centuries, there have been men and women who have been able to stand up for the truth. I told you two weeks ago about Peter's story. I beg to differ. Ministry amid the tear gas. There's a person that could stand up and say, what's happening in this country is wrong. We have the Archbishop today and lots of the other clergy and faiths coming together for a day, praying for peace in our country. Prayer is important. St. Augustine reminds us that to pray is to work. But to work is also to pray. There's a two-sided relationship to that. And so, yes, we must strengthen with prayers. And it was interesting when uh, Francis was using the litany. Now, the litany you can find on page 73 and following in the prayer book. And he said, deliver us, good Lord. Now, I, I did my second curacy under Arch, um, Archdeacon um, Ted McKenzie. He later became a bishop suffragan in Cape Town. And um, he always wanted his curate to sit next to him in a church council meeting. And uh, I don't know whether he wanted, you know, he must follow up on that and he must follow up on this. But, uh, but he would always mutter under his breath, you know, when someone in the church council made a ridiculous suggestion, then he'd say, good Lord, deliver us. <laughs> you know? and, and so when we, was, we were looking at that, and, I, and really, there are so many things in our society of, of, of really, really crazy things that we have to be able to say, good Lord, deliver us, and then we have to go out and work for that deliverance and join hands with others that are working for that kind of deliverance. Nothing irked me more this week than when I listened to the, the Taba Hospital in Zanin. 
where three doctors got attacked while they were sleeping. And uh, I know it's close to home. My eldest son's a medic, and I know what trauma he had when he had to do his uh, internship and then community service and the conditions they have to work under. And any family who's been through that will know what kind of situation. But can you think that people don't care about security? Can you think that people don't care about what happens in our hospitals? That people don't care about what happens in our schools? That if everybody just washes their hands almost in innocence to say, well, you know, they didn't get enough money for the fence, or I didn't get enough money for that. Who takes responsibility for anything, you see? And we see that same dodginess with, with Pilate. Pilate knows he has a tricky issue. I want to please the Jews, Jewish leadership, but I must also keep Rome happy, so now let me see if I can use the law. So there's a custom that you release one prisoner, so now maybe I can release Jesus under that ruse. And so he comes with the proposal, must I release? He even kind of uh, gives them the idea that they must release Jesus. And of course they come back. That's where I stopped and uh, in the gospel reading. And then they say, no, yeah, we want Barabbas. Okay? And that's the choices people make. They won't stand up for that which is right. And we are going to be called upon in this country more and more to stand up for that which is right. It's not going to make us popular, right? We're not going to win the popularity vote. But the charlatans in our midst must be unmasked. We must say we're not going to go along with that anymore. We are going to have to take, when we go and vote, we are going to have to pray and then vote deeply with our consciences. And we're going to have to hold our politicians and our municipal councillors. We've got to hold them accountable. And in the same way, we've got to take a new interest in the kind of society that we're building. If Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, then how do we build worth into our lives and into our society and our families? We can only do that if we build our lives on Jesus. And we become more and more like him every day. That we start to see the characteristics of Jesus in our society. When we see that example of love, and the one thing that upset Jesus more than anything else is hypocrisy. I started my 10 weeks or so with St. Wilfred's with talking about stewardship and the rule of life. <laughs> and I want to conclude it by saying a rule of life on a piece of paper means nothing. And a rule of life that isn't enabling us to be able to meet the challenges of our daily living. And there are lots of things, of challenges we must meet. A friend's father was diagnosed with um, cancer this week. And the person is 85. And for me, it's been a blessing to see how this family has embraced 
this challenge that they face. <clears throat> they are all practicing Christians. But the way they've embraced this bad news and taken it on board and are working through it shows what can be achieved if our lives are rooted on Christ. And there are countless other examples. I happen to be watching NCIS New Orleans. Now, they've got a funny way when they come to a burial. They go through the streets and they sing and they parade and they go. It's almost like uh, de, las, de las Morta or something. And they have a way of celebrating the dead in a particular way. <clears throat> and someone was trying to explain this. And they said, well, if you run away from death, you run away from life. And so I thought about that because you must think so. You can't just accept everything that other people say. And yes, death is an integral part of life. But how do we deal with that difficult part of life called death if we're not rooted in Christ? That Christ is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. That everything and underneath are God's everlasting arms. Now, if we don't have a vibrant faith and a faith that is tested and a faith that allows one to deal with all the challenges. I could probably keep you here for a long time telling you about the challenges that people face. I've taken two examples. But what about people having difficulties with children? Children on drugs. Children who are going wrong. People suffering from depression people who just don't know what to do next. The one thing I am confident about, that I can say to you, that Jesus is the truth. That when he says, come unto me all that travail and are heavy laden, and I will give you peace, then that is not an idle promise. It's a reality. It's something that you can depend on and something that can take you through it. I conclude with, I would say, a prayer. Because today is Christ the King. And many churches have a, a crucifix at the back. Where it's not a crucifix like that one where you see that's the crucified Christ. But when you see a Christ dressed in priestly garb with a chasuble, <laughs> and uh, it's, that's the Christ the King, the Christus Rex, they call it. And uh, Christ is King. And He should be King in our lives, and King in our homes, and King in our communities. And we should be pointing others to Christ the King. And if our rule of life is full of energy and life and alive in our lives, others will see it. And others will be drawn to Christ through our witness Bishop Ted McKenzie was also the one who taught me that you must preach the gospel with your life because sometimes that is the only gospel that others will read. The example that you set, the tone that you set, the way you speak to each other, the way you love, the way you're able to draw people in and the way you are able to reach out to this whole community. And I'm convinced that as the church takes a stronger role in our society, back in our schools and our universities, back 
in our hospitals and our communities. So we will start to see an end to all these charlatans. There's a road that I take, and everywhere there's this pastor that was raping his uh, congregants. And how is a thing like that allowed to exist? Why can't the police go in there and, you know, justice can act? How do we allow charlatans in our midst like that? You know? And, but the reason it is, is because who is taking account? And when they have these political rallies, I want to be, I want to ask our politicians, where were you? when kids were being stabbed at schools? Where were you when doctors were being um, 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 molested in, while they were sleeping? These are the kinds of things which are not easy to speak about. But unless we embody the spirit of Christ, we allow Christ to work through us, evil is going to thrive. And I do believe that evil will not survive where Christians stand up. And that wonderful chorus, or hymn rather, that we sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. There has to be a new rallying call, a new seriousness in our vocation. And let me end on a, a, it gave me a lot of joy to be here, and it was a lot of joy for me today to hear at the early service that Johnny is being ordained, and you'll hear it again in the notices. But I was so thrilled that another young person is coming into the ministry, that the church is producing young people that is taking up the vocation of the ministry, the priesthood. And I think that is wonderful. So do pray for Johnny and give him your support. And that's another feather in St. Wilfred's cap. And I'm sure we're going to hear of many others in the years to come as this church becomes a thriving beacon of hope in a very troubled country. Amen. <laughs>